Section 5 Combray Combray at a distance, from a twenty-mile radius, as we used to see it from the railway when we arrived there every year in Holy Week, was no more than a church epitomizing the town, representing it, speaking of it and for it to the horizon, and as one drew near, gathering close about its long, dark cloak, sheltering from the wind on the open plain, as a shepherd gathers his sheep, the woolly grey backs of its flocking houses, which a fragment of its medieval ramparts enclosed here and there, in an outline as scrupulously circular as that of a little town in a primitive painting. To live in, Combray was a trifle depressing, like its streets, whose houses, built of the blackened stone of the country, fronted with outside steps, capped with gables which projected long shadows downwards, were so dark that one had, as soon as the sun began to go down, to draw back the curtains in the sitting-room windows. Streets with the solemn names of saints, not a few of whom figured in the history of the early lords of Combray, such as the Rue Saint-Hilaire, the Rue Saint-Jacques, in which my aunt's house stood, the Rue Saint-Hildegard, which ran past her railings, and the Rue du Saint-Esprit, on to which the little garden gate opened. And these Combray streets exist in so remote a quarter of my memory, painted in colours so different from those in which the world is decked for me to-day, that in fact one and all of them, and the church which towered above them in the square, seem to me now more unsubstantial than the projections of my magic lantern, while at times I feel that to be able to cross the Rue Saint-Hilaire again, to engage a room in the Rue de l'Oiseau, in the old hostelry of the Oiseau Fleche, from whose windows in the pavement used to rise a smell of cooking, which rises still in my mind now and then, in the same warm gusts of comfort, would be to secure a contact with the unseen world more marvellously supernatural than it would be to make Golo's acquaintance and to chat with Genevieve de Brabant. My grandfather's cousin, by courtesy my great-aunt, with whom we used to stay, was the mother of that Aunt Leoni who, since her husband's, my uncle Octave's, death, had gradually declined to leave, first Combray, then her house in Combray, then her bedroom, and finally her bed, and who now never came down, but lay perpetually in an indefinite condition of grief, physical exhaustion, illness, obsessions, and religious observances. Her own room looked out over the Rue Saint-Jacques, which ran a long way further, to end in the Grand Pré, as distinct from the Petit Pré, a green space in the centre of the town where three streets met, and which, monotonous and grey, with the three high steps of stone before almost every one of its doors, seemed like a deep furrow, cut by some sculptor of Gothic images, in the very block of stone, out of which he had fashioned a calvary, or a crib. My aunt's life was now practically confined to two adjoining rooms, in one of which she would rest in the afternoon, while they aired the other. They were rooms of that country order which, just as in certain climes, whole tracts of air or ocean are illuminated or scented by myriads of protozoa which we cannot see, fascinate our sense of smell with the countless odours springing from their own special virtues, wisdom, habits, a whole secret system of life, invisible, superabundant, and profoundly moral, which their atmosphere holds in solution. Smells natural enough indeed, and coloured by circumstances as are those of the neighbouring countryside, but already humanised, domesticated, confined, an exquisite, skilful, limpid jelly, 
blending all the fruits of the season which have left the orchard for the storeroom, smells changing with the year, but plenishing domestic smells, which compensate for the sharpness of hoar-frost with the sweet savour of warm bread, smells lazy and punctual as a village clock, roving smells, pious smells, rejoicing in a peace which brings only an increase of anxiety, and in a prosiness which serves as a deep source of poetry to the stranger, who passes through their midst without having lived amongst them. The air of those rooms was saturated with a fine bouquet of a silence, so nourishing, so succulent, that I could not enter them without a sort of greedy enjoyment, particularly on those first mornings, chilly still, of the Easter holidays, when I could taste it more fully because I had just arrived then at Combray. Before I went in to wish my aunt good day, I would be kept waiting a little time in the outer room, where the sun, a wintry sun still, had crept in to warm itself before the fire, lighted already between its two brick sides, and plastering all the room and everything in it with a smell of soot making the room like one of those great open hearths which one finds in the country, or one of the canopied mantelpieces in old castles, under which one sits hoping that in the world outside it is raining or snowing, hoping almost for a catastrophic deluge to add the romance of shelter and security to the comfort of a snug retreat. I would turn to and fro between the prayer desk and the stamped velvet armchairs, each one always draped in its crocheted antimacassar, while the fire, baking like a pie the appetizing smells with which the air of the room was thickly clotted, which the dewy and sunny freshness of the morning had already raised and started to set, puffed them and glazed them and fluted them and swelled them into an invisible, though not impalpable, country cake, an immense puff pastry, in which, barely waiting to savour the crustier, more delicate, more respectable, but also drier smells of the cupboard, the chest of drawers and the patterned wallpaper, I always returned with an unconfessed gluttony to bury myself in the nondescript, resinous, dull, indigestible, and fruity smell of the flowered quilt. In the next room, I could hear my aunt talking quietly to herself. She never spoke, save in low tones, because she believed that there was something broken in her head, and floating loose there, which she might displace by talking too loud. But she never remained for long, even when alone, without saying something, because she believed that it was good for her throat, and that by keeping the blood there in circulation, it would make less frequent the chokings and other pains to which she was liable. Besides, in the life of complete inertia which she led, she attached to the least of her sensations an extraordinary importance, endowed them with a protean ubiquity which made it difficult for her to keep them secret, and, failing a confidant to whom she might communicate them, she used to promulgate them to herself in an unceasing monologue which was her sole form of activity. Unfortunately, having formed the habit of thinking aloud, she did not always take care to see that there was no one in the adjoining room, and I would often hear her saying to herself, I must not forget that I never slept a wink. For, never sleeping a wink, was her great claim to distinction and one admitted and respected in our household vocabulary. In the morning, Françoise would not call her, but would simply come to her. During the day, 
when my aunt wished to take a nap, we used to say just that she wished to be quiet, or to rest, and when in conversation she so far forgot herself as to say, What made me wake up? or I dreamed that, she would flush, and at once correct herself. After waiting a minute, I would go in and kiss her. Francoise would be making her tea, or, if my aunt were feeling upset, she would ask instead for her tisane, and it would be my duty to shake out of the chemist's little package onto a plate the amount of lime blossom required for infusion in boiling water. The drying of the stems had twisted them into a fantastic trellis, in whose intervals the pale flowers opened, as though a painter had arranged them there, grouping them in the most decorative poses. The leaves, which had lost or altered their own appearance, assumed those instead of the most incongruous things imaginable, as though the transparent wings of flies, or the blank sides of labels, or the petals of roses, had been collected and pounded, or interwoven as birds weave the material for their nests. A thousand trifling little details, the charming prodigality of the chemist, details which would have been eliminated from an artificial preparation, gave me, like a book, in which one is astonished to read the name of a person whom one knows, the pleasure of finding that these were indeed real lime blossoms, like those I had seen, when coming from the train, in the Avenue de la Gare, altered, but only because they were not imitations, but the very same blossoms, which had grown old and as each new character is merely a metamorphosis from something older. In these little grey balls, I recognised green buds plucked before their time, but beyond all else the rosy, moony, tender glow which lit up the blossoms among the frail forest of stems from which they hung like little golden roses, marking as the radiance upon an old wall still marks the place of a vanished fresco, the difference between those parts of the tree which had, and those which had not been, in bloom, showed me that these were petals which, before their flowering time, the chemist's package had embalmed on warm evenings of spring. That rosy candlelight was still their colour, but half extinguished, and deadened in the diminished life which was now theirs, and which may be called the twilight of a flower. Presently my aunt was able to dip in the boiling infusion, in which she would relish the savour of dead or faded blossom, a little madlin, of which she would hold out a piece to me when it was sufficiently soft. At one side of her bed stood a big yellow chest of drawers of lemon wood, and a table which served at once as pharmacy and as high altar, on which, beneath a statue of Our Lady and a bottle of Vichy Celestine, might be found her service books and her medical prescriptions, everything that she needed for the performance in bed of her duties to soul and body, to keep the proper times for pepsin and for vespers. On the other side, her bed was bounded by the window. She had the street beneath her eyes, and would read in it from morning to night to divert the tedium of her life, like a Persian prince, the daily but immemorial chronicles of Combray, which she would discuss in detail afterwards with Francoise. I would not have been five minutes with my aunt before she would send me away in case I made her tired. She would hold out for me to kiss her sad brow, pale and lifeless, on which at this early hour she would not yet have arranged the false hair, and through which the bones shone like the points of a crown of thorns or the beads of a rosary 
and she would say to me, No, my poor child, you must go away. Go and get ready for mass. And if you see Françoise downstairs, tell her not to stay too long amusing herself with you. She must come up soon to see if I want anything. Françoise, who had been for many years in my aunt's service, and did not at that time suspect that she would one day be transferred entirely to ours, was a little inclined to desert my aunt during the months which we spent in her house. There had been in my infancy, before we first went to Combray, and when my aunt Léonie used still to spend the winter in Paris with her mother, a time when I knew Françoise so little that on New Year's Day, before going into my great-aunt's house, my mother put a five-franc piece in my hand and said, Now be careful. Don't make any mistake. Wait until you hear me say, Good morning, Françoise, and I touch your arm before you give it to her. No sooner had we arrived in my aunt's dark hall than we saw in the gloom, beneath the frills of her snowy cap, as stiff and fragile as if it had been made of spun sugar, the concentric waves of the smile of anticipatory gratitude. It was Françoise, motionless and erect, framed in the small doorway of the corridor, like the statue of a saint in its niche. When we had grown more accustomed to this religious darkness, we could discern in her features a disinterested love of all humanity, blended with a tender respect for the upper classes, which raised to the most honourable quarter of her heart the hope of receiving her due reward. Mamma pinched my arm sharply, and said in a loud voice, Good morning, Françoise. At this signal, my fingers parted, and I let fall the coin, which found a receptacle in a confused but outstretched hand. But since we had begun to go to Combray, there was no one I knew better than Françoise. We were her favourites, and in the first years at least, while she showed the same consideration for us as for my aunt, she enjoyed us with a keener relish, because we had, in addition to our dignity as part of the family, for she had for those invisible bonds by which community of blood unites the members of a family, as much respect as any Greek tragedian. The fresh charm of not being her customary employers. And so, with what joy would she welcome us, with what sorrow complain that the weather was still so bad for us on the day of our arrival, just before Easter, when there was often an icy wind, while Mamma inquired after her daughter and her nephews, and if her grandson was good-looking, and what they were going to make of him and whether he took after his granny. Later, when no one else was in the room, Mamma, who knew that Françoise was still mourning for her parents, who had been dead for years, would speak of them kindly, asking her endless little questions about them and their lives. She had guessed that Françoise was not over-fond of her son-in-law, and that he spoiled the pleasure she found in visiting her daughter, as the two could not talk so freely when he was there. And so one day, when Françoise was going to their house, some miles from Combray, Mamma said to her with a smile, Tell me, Françoise, if Julien has had to go away, and you have Marguerite to yourself all day, you will be very sorry, but will make the best of it, won't you? And Françoise answered, laughing. Madame knows everything. Madame is worse than the X-rays. She pronounced X with an affectation of difficulty, and with a smile in deprecation of her, an unlettered woman's, daring to employ a scientific term. They brought here for Madame Octave, which see what is in your heart. And she went off, disturbed that any one should be caring about her, perhaps anxious that we should not see her in tears. 
Mamma was the first person who had given her the pleasure of feeling that her peasant existence, with its simple joys and sorrows, might offer some interest, might be a source of grief or pleasure to someone other than herself. My aunt resigned herself to doing without Françoise to some extent during our visits, knowing how much my mother appreciated the services of so active and intelligent a maid, one who looked as smart at five o'clock in the morning in her kitchen, under a cap whose stiff and dazzling frills seemed to be made of porcelain, as when dressed for church-going, who did everything in the right way, who toiled like a horse, whether she was well or ill, but without noise, without the appearance of doing anything. The only one of my aunt's maids who, when Mamma asked for hot water or black coffee, would bring them actually boiling. She was one of those servants who in a household seem least satisfactory at first to a stranger, doubtless because they take no pains to make a conquest of him, and show him no special attention, knowing very well that they have no real need of him, that he will cease to be invited to the house sooner than they will be dismissed from it who, on the other hand, cling with most fidelity to those masters and mistresses who have tested and proved their real capacity, and do not look for that superficial responsiveness, that slavish affability, which may impress a stranger favourably, but often conceals an utter barrenness of spirit, in which no amount of training can produce the least trace of individuality. When Françoise, having seen that my parents had everything they required, first went upstairs again to give my aunt her pepsin, and to find out from her what she would take for luncheon, very few mornings passed, but she was called upon to give an opinion, or to furnish an explanation, in regard to some important event. Just fancy, Françoise, Madame Goupil went by more than a quarter of an hour late to fetch her sister. If she loses any more time on the way, I should not be at all surprised if she got in after the elevation. Well, there'd be nothing wonderful in that, would be the answer. Or, Françoise, if you had come in five minutes ago, you would have seen Madame Imbert go past with some asparagus twice the size of what Mother Callot has. Do try to find out from her cook where she got them. You know you've been putting asparagus in all your sauces this spring. You might be able to get some like these for our visitors. I shouldn't be surprised if they came from the curies, Françoise would say. And I'm sure you wouldn't, my poor Françoise, my aunt would reply, raising her shoulders. From the curies, indeed. You know quite well that he can never grow anything but wretched little twigs of asparagus. Not asparagus at all. I tell you, these ones were as thick as my arm. Not your arm, of course, but my poor arm, which has grown so much thinner again this year. Or, Françoise, didn't you hear that bell just now? It split my head. No, Madame Octave. Ah, poor girl, your skull must be very thick. You may thank God for that. It was Magualone, come to fetch Dr. Piperot. He came out with her at once, and they went off along the Rue de l'Oiseau. There must be some child ill. Oh, dear, dear, the poor little creature! would come with a sigh from Françoise, who could not hear of any calamity befalling a person unknown to her, even in some distant part of the world, without beginning to lament. Or... Françoise, for whom did they toll the passing bell just now? Oh dear, of course, it would be for Madame Rousseau, and to think that I had forgotten that she passed away the other night. Indeed, it is time the Lord called me home too. I don't know what has become of my head since I lost my poor Octave. But I am wasting your time, my good girl. Indeed, no, Madame Octave, my time is not so precious. Whoever made our time didn't sell it to us. I am just going to see that my fire hasn't gone out. In this way, Françoise and my aunt made a critical valuation between them, 
in the course of these morning sessions, of the earliest happenings of the day. But sometimes these happenings assumed so mysterious or so alarming an air, that my aunt felt she could not wait until it was time for Françoise to come upstairs, and then a formidable and quadruple peal would resound through the house. "'But, Madame Octave, it is not time for your pepsin,' Françoise would begin. "'Are you feeling faint?' "'No, thank you, Françoise,' my aunt would reply. "'That is to say, yes, for you know well that there is very seldom a time when I don't feel faint. One day I shall pass away like Madame Rousseau, before I know where I am. But that is not why I rang. Would you believe that I have just seen, as plainly as I see you, Madame Goupil, with a little girl I didn't know at all? Run and get a penny worth of salt from Camus. It's not often that Theodore can't tell you who a person is. But that must be Monsieur Poupin's daughter, Françoise would say preferring to stick to an immediate explanation, since she had been perhaps twice already into Camus' shop that morning. Monsieur Poupin's daughter? Oh, that's a likely story, my poor Françoise. Do you think I should not have recognised Monsieur Poupin's daughter? But I don't mean the big one, Madame Octave. I mean the little girl, the one who goes to school at Joy. I seem to have seen her once already this morning. Oh, if that's what it is! my aunt would say. She must have come over for the holidays. Yes, that is it. No need to ask. She will have come over for the holidays. But then we shall soon see Madame Sazerat come along and ring her sister's doorbell for her luncheon. That will be it. I saw the boy from Galapins go by with a tart. You will see that the tart was for Madame Goupil. Once Madame Goupil has anyone in the house, Madame Octave, you won't be long in seeing all her folk going into their luncheon there, for it's not so early as it was, would be the answer. But Françoise, who was anxious to retire downstairs to look after our own meal, was not sorry to leave my aunt with the prospect of such a distraction. Oh, not before midday, my aunt would reply in a tone of resignation, darting an uneasy glance at the clock, but stealthily so as not to let it be seen that she, who had renounced all earthly joys, yet found a keen satisfaction in learning that Madame Goupil was expecting company to luncheon, though, alas, she must wait a little more than an hour still before enjoying the spectacle. And it will come in the middle of my luncheon, she would murmur to herself, her luncheon was such a distraction in itself that she did not like any other to come at the same time. At least you will not forget to give me my creamed eggs on one of the flat plates. These were the only plates which had pictures on them, and my aunt used to amuse herself at every meal by reading the description on whichever might have been sent up to her. She would put on her spectacles and spell out, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, Aladdin, or the Wonderful Lamp, and smile, and say, Very good indeed. I may as well go across to Camus, Françoise would hazard, seeing that my aunt had no longer any intention of sending her there. No, no, it's not worth while now. It's certain to be the Poupin girl. My poor Françoise, I'm sorry to have made you come upstairs for nothing. But it was not for nothing, as my aunt well knew, that she had rung for Françoise, since at Combray a person whom one didn't know at all was as incredible a being as any mythological deity, and it was apt to be forgotten that after each occasion on which there had appeared in the Rue du Saint-Esprit, or in the square, one of these bewildering phenomena careful and exhaustive researches had invariably reduced the fabulous monster to the proportions of a person whom one did know, either personally or in the abstract, in his or her civil status, as being more or less closely related to some family in Combray. It would turn out to be Madame Sauton's son discharged from the army, 
or the Abbey Perdrill's niece, come home from her convent, or the Curé's brother, a tax collector at Châteaudun, who had just retired on a pension, or had come over to Combray for the holidays. On first noticing them, you have been impressed by the thought that there might be in Combray people whom you didn't know at all, simply because you had failed to recognise or identify them at once. And yet long beforehand, Madame Sultan and the Curé had given warning that they expected their strangers. In the evening, when I came in and went upstairs to tell my aunt the incidents of our walk, if I was rash enough to say to her that we had passed, near the Pont Vieux, a man whom my grandfather didn't know. A man grandfather didn't know at all? she would exclaim. That's a likely story. Nonetheless, she would be a little disturbed by the news. She would wish to have the details correctly. And so my grandfather would be summoned. Who can it have been that you passed near the Pont Vieux, uncle? A man you didn't know at all? Why, of course I did, my grandfather would answer. It was Prosper, Madame Burleboeuf's gardener's brother. Ah, oh, well, my aunt would say, calm again but slightly flushed still, and the boy told me that you had passed a man you didn't know at all. After which I would be warned to be more careful of what I said, and not to upset my aunt so by thoughtless remarks. Everyone was so well known in Combray, animals as well as people, that if my aunt had happened to see a dog go by, which she didn't know at all, she would think about it incessantly, devoting to the solution of the incomprehensible problem all her inductive talent and her leisure hours. That will be Madame Sazerat's dog, Françoise would suggest, without any real conviction, but in the hope of peace, and so that my aunt should not split her head. As if I didn't know Madame Sazerat's dog! For my aunt's critical mind would not so easily admit any fresh fact. Ah, but that will be the new dog Monsieur Galopin has brought her from Lisieux. Oh, if that's what it is! It seems it's a most engaging animal, Françoise would go on, having got the story from Theodore. As clever as a Christian, always in a good temper, always friendly, always everything that's nice. It's not often you see an animal so well behaved at that age. Madame Octave, it's high time I left you. I can't afford to stay here amusing myself. Look, it's nearly ten o'clock, and my fire not lighted yet, and I've still to dress the asparagus. What, Francoise? More asparagus? It's regular disease of asparagus you have got this year. You'll make our Parisians sick of it. No, no, Madame Octave, they like it well enough. They'll be coming back from church soon as hungry as hunters, and they won't eat it out of the back of their spoons, you'll see. Church? Why, they must be there now. You'd better not lose any time. Go and look after your luncheon. While my aunt gossiped on in this way with Françoise, I would have accompanied my parents to Mass. How I loved it! How clearly I can see it still! Our church at Combray! The old porch by which we went in, black and full of holes as a colander, was worn out of shape and deeply furrowed at the sides, as also was the holy water stoop to which it led us, just as if the gentle grazing touch of the cloaks of peasant women going into the church, and of their fingers dipping into the water, had managed by age-long repetition to acquire a destructive force to impress itself on the stone, to carve ruts in it like those made by cartwheels upon stone gateposts, against which they are driven every day. Its memorial stones, beneath which the noble dust of the abbots of Combray, who were buried there, furnished the choir with a sort of spiritual pavement, were themselves no longer hard and lifeless matter, for time had softened and sweetened them, and had made them melt like honey, and flow beyond their proper margins, either surging out in a milky, frothing wave, washing from its place a florid Gothic capital, drowning the white violets of the marble floor, or else reabsorbed into their limits, contracting still further a crabbed Latin inscription, 
bringing a fresh touch of fantasy into the arrangement of its curtailed characters, closing together two letters of some word of which the rest were disproportionately scattered. Its windows were never so brilliant as on days when the sun scarcely shone, so that if it was dull outside, you might be certain of fine weather in church. One of them was filled from top to bottom by a solitary figure, like the king on a playing card, who lived up there beneath his canopy of stone, between earth and heaven, and in the blue light of its slanting shadow, on weekdays sometimes, at noon, when there was no service, at one of those rare moments when the airy empty church, more human somehow, and more luxurious, with the sun showing off all its rich furnishings, seemed to have almost a habitable air, like the whole, all sculptured stone and painted glass, of some medieval mansion. You might see Madame Sazerat, kneel for an instant, laying down on the chair beside her own, a neatly corded parcel of little cakes which she had just bought at the baker's, and was taking home for her luncheon. In another, a mountain of rosy snow, at whose foot a battle was being fought, seemed to have frozen the window also, which is swelled and distorted with its cloudy sleet, like a pane to which snowflakes have drifted and clung, but flakes illumined by a sunrise, the same doubtless which purpled the reredos of the altar, with tints so fresh that they seemed rather to be thrown on it for a moment by a light shining from outside, and shortly to be extinguished, than painted, and permanently fastened on the stone. And all of them were so old that you could see here and there the silvery antiquity sparkling with the dust of centuries, and showing in its threadbare brilliance the very cords of their lovely tapestry of glass. There was one among them which was a tall panel composed of a hundred little rectangular windows, of blue principally, like a great game of patience, of the kind planned to beguile King Charles the Sixth, but, either because a ray of sunlight had gleamed through it, or because my own shifting vision had drawn across the window, whose colours died away, and were rekindled by turns, a rare and transient fire, the next instant it had taken on all the iridescence of a peacock's tail, then shook and wavered in a flaming and fantastic shower, distilled and dropping from the groin of the dark and rocky vault down the moist walls, as though it were along the bed of some rainbow grotto of sinuous stalactites that I was following my parents, who marched before me, their prayer-books clasped in their hands. A moment later the little lozenge windows had put on the deep transparency, the unbreakable hardness of sapphires clustered on some enormous breastplate, but beyond which could be distinguished, dearer than all such treasures, a fleeting smile from the sun, which could be seen and felt as well here, in the blue and gentle flood in which it washed the masonry, as on the pavement of the square or the straw of the market-place, and even on our first Sundays, when we came down before Easter, it would console me for the blackness and bareness of the earth outside, by making burst into blossom, as in some springtime in old history among the airs of St. Louis, this dazzling and gilded carpet of forget-me-nots in glass. Two tapestries of high warp represented the coronation of Esther, in which tradition would have it that the weaver had given to Ahasuerus the features of one of the kings of France, and to Esther those of a lady of Guermont whose lover he had been. Their colours had melted into one another, so as to add expression, relief, light to the pictures. A touch of red over the lips of Esther had strayed beyond their outline, the yellow on her dress was spread with such unctuous plumpness as to have acquired a kind of solidity, and stood boldly out from the receding atmosphere, while the green of the trees, which was still bright in silk and wool 
among the lower parts of the panel, but had quite gone at the top, separated in a paler scheme, above the dark trunks, the yellowing upper branches, tanned and half obliterated by the sharp though sidelong rays of an invisible sun. All these things, and, still more than these, the treasures which had come to the church from personages who to me were almost legendary figures, such as the golden cross wrought, it was said, by St. Eloi, and presented by Dagobert, and the tombs of the sons of Louis the Germanic, in porphyry and enamelled copper, because of which I used to go forward into the church when we were making our way to our chairs as into a fairy haunted valley, where the rustic sees with amazement on a rock, a tree, a marsh, the tangible proofs of the little people's supernatural passage. All these things made of the church for me something entirely different from the rest of the town, a building which occupied, so to speak, four dimensions of space, the name of the fourth being time, which had sailed the centuries with that old nave, where bay after bay, chapel after chapel, seemed to stretch across and hold down and conquer not merely a few yards of soil, but each successive epoch from which the whole building had emerged triumphant, hiding the rugged barbarities of the eleventh century in the thickness of its walls, through which nothing could be seen of the heavy arches, long stopped and blinded with coarse blocks of ashlar, except where, near the porch, a deep groove was furrowed into one wall by the tower stair and even there the barbarity was veiled by the graceful Gothic arcade which pressed coquettishly upon it, like a row of grown-up sisters who, to hide him from the eyes of strangers, arranged themselves smilingly in front of a countrified, unmannerly, and ill-dressed younger brother, rearing into the sky above the square a tower which had looked down upon St. Louis, and seemed to behold him still, and thrusting down with its crypt into the blackness of a Merovingian night, through which, guiding us with groping fingertips beneath the shadowy vault, ripped strongly as an immense bat's wing of stone, Theodore or his sister would light up for us with a candle the tomb of Sigebert's little daughter, in which a deep hole, like the bed of a fossil, had been bored, or so it was said, by a crystal lamp which, on the night when the Frankish princess was murdered, had left, of its own accord, the golden chains by which it was suspended where the apse is to-day, and with neither the crystal broken nor the light extinguished had buried itself in the stone through which it had gently forced its way. And then the apse of Combray. What am I to say of that? It was so coarse, so devoid of artistic beauty, even of the religious spirit. From outside, since the street crossing which it commanded was on a lower level, its great wall was thrust upwards from a basement of unfaced ashlar, jagged with flints, in all of which there was nothing particularly ecclesiastical. The windows seemed to have been pierced at an abnormal height, and its whole appearance was that of a prison wall, rather than of a church and certainly in later years were I to recall all the glorious apses that I had seen, it would never enter my mind to compare with any one of them the apse of Combray. Only, one day, turning out of a little street in some country town, I came upon three alleyways that converged, and facing them an old wall, rubbed, worn, crumbling, and unusually high, with windows pierced in it far overhead, and the same asymmetrical appearance as the apse of Combray. And at that moment I did not say to myself, as at Chartres I might have done, or at Reims, with what strength the religious feeling had been expressed in its construction. But instinctively I exclaimed, The Church! The Church! a dear familiar friend, close pressed in the Rue Saint-Hilaire, upon which his north door opened, 
by its two neighbours, Madame Loiseau's house, and the pharmacy of Monsieur Rapin, against which its walls rested without interspace. A simple citizen of Combray, who might have had her number in the street, had the streets of Combray borne numbers, and at whose door one felt that the postman ought to stop on his morning rounds, before going into Madame Loiseau's, and after leaving Monsieur Rapin's, there existed, for all that, between the church and everything in Combray that was not the church, a clear line of demarcation which I have never succeeded in eliminating from my mind. In vain might Madame Loiseau deck her window-sills with fuchsias, which developed the bad habit of letting their branches trail at all times, and in all directions, head downwards, and whose flowers had no more important business, when they were big enough to taste the joys of life, than to go and cool their purple, congested cheeks against the dark front of the church. To me such conduct sanctified the fuchsias not at all. Between the flowers and the blackened stones towards which they leaned, if my eyes could discern no interval, my mind preserved the impression of an abyss. End of section 5